I'm Donna. And I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 115. And look, let me just start with this. Last episode, when I was talking about extremists and how every religion has its own extremists, it was very poor wording. And I'm so sorry to those that I made it sound like their entire religion was an extremist. So how I said, I mean, Christianity has extremists in it too. And I said Mormons and Pentecostals, but I didn't mean that as whole denominations of Christianity. I just mean that even various denominations of Christianity have their own extremists, not that Pentecostals and Mormons as a whole are extreme. So I'm very sorry that I offended some people with that because that's definitely not what I meant. Yeah, I didn't catch it because I speak Carrie and (laughs) that made perfect sense to me. (laughs) And yeah, it was brought to our attention and it was like, oh God, we like listened back and we were like, oh no, we can definitely tell what you're talking about now. Oh yeah, 100% can hear like where Mm -hmm. it's like, Oh, yeah, I think I let off left out some words. Yeah, but like, I'm telling you, face to face, I know exactly what she's saying, you know? Mm -hmm. So, from the bottom of my heart, I'm so sorry. Well, while we're on a serious note, we feel like these current events cannot go without us acknowledging what's going on in the States right now with the murder of George Floyd. We just want to say that what happened is fucking wrong inhumane no person should ever be treated that way it's heartbreaking to watch the videos to i don't even know it breaks my heart i feel so sorry for the families that are involved yes i I mean i don't even know what to say other than it just is horrible and that poor soul Yes, and also sorry for the bystanders because there was a young girl there. A a child, like a seven-year-old that was interviewed. Yes, and I can't get his words out of my head, and I just watched the video. Right. Could you imagine hearing that Mm -mm. in person? The other thing that we need to acknowledge is that the local mayor down here in Mississippi made some very inappropriate comments on Twitter about the situation. And Facebook. And yes, yes. And it has literally made international news. Mm -hmm. It is fucking shameful. And he should be fired. Yes. However, there are no laws in place in Mississippi for them to get him out of office. So, like, they had an emergency meeting, and the board of aldermen asked him to resign. He refused. He's got his attorney. This is going to go a long time. There have already been protests in our town. Peaceful protest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And also, let me interject that not only did he tweet and, well, use social media for his personal opinions on his official accounts, He also never apologized at the town meeting. Never apologized. The words, I'm sorry, never came out of his mouth unless he was like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Mm -hmm. Or I'm sorry you don't know how much I love this city. Mm -hmm. Never, I'm sorry for that tweet. I'm sorry for saying those things. I'm sorry how my words can impact the Floyd family. Right. Um, So... Y'all know we live in Mississippi and know that that is not our views. And the city has come out strong against this and was just amazing at the board meeting last night and at the protest today. Like, it's just been amazing to see this area rally around each other and stand up against hate and bullying and systematic racism and all the things that keep these horrible, 
atrocious things like what happened to George Floyd that keep things like that happening. Exactly. Wow, we just came out with heavy-hitting subjects like woo, religion, politics, all the things you're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> On a comedy podcast <laughs> about murder and ghosts. <laughs> Well, we know that there are at least a few people that love us, even when we bring up heavy subjects. That's right, because we got new Patreoners. Heck yeah. So thank you so much, Rebecca B. from Ohio. Kendra H. from Arizona. Amrith Taji D. from Utah. Tyann S. from Idaho. Vicki G. from North Carolina. And Misty F. from Arkansas. Thank y'all so much for joining And supporting us, if y'all want a shout out, just like they did, y'all go over to www.patreon.com forward slash the APC podcast. Okay, let's jump right in to more serious shit. Oh, yay. Murder. This one, I feel like, is pretty well known. It's a very controversial one. Because there's really, well, spoiler alert, uh, not an ending. Oh, fuck. Okay. We're going to talk about the murder of Robert Eric Wan. So I want you to picture it. It's 930 on August 2nd, 2006. And Robert Wan, who was the attorney for Radio Free Asia in D.C., he called his wife, Kathy, He's like, hey, I'm on my way back to the office because there was a a new radio, like, DJ radio jockey thingy. Okay. And he wanted to meet him. And so he was going to be – and that guy worked the night shift, so he had to stay, like, super late. And so he's like, hey, I'm on my way back. But when I leave here, I'm actually going to go stay at my buddy's house because he lived, like, more than an hour outside of D.C. and it was late. And so he's like, I'm just going to stay with my buddy And then go to work the next morning. I'll be home tomorrow night. At about 1030, Robert got to his friend's house. And 90 minutes after that, Kathy got the phone call that changed her life. Robert's friend was on the phone. And he told Kathy that Robert had been stabbed and that he was taken to George Washington University Hospital. Kathy calls Robert's parents. They all come in from Brooklyn, which is where Robert grew up. And when they get there, they found out that Robert had been pronounced dead at 1225 a.m. Oh, my gosh. So the question was, what the fuck happened? This is what we know. Robert had gone to his friend's house, and his name was Joe Price. Joe and Robert met each other in college They were, I mean, great friends in college. Both went their separate ways to different law schools, but they stayed in contact. And this was actually the first night that Robert had ever spent the night at Joe's house. Well, Joe, or Joseph Price is his full name, was married to Victor Zaborski. And they had two other roommates, Dylan Ward, and then they had... A female roommate that but she, she lived in like the basement apartment underneath. So she didn't really live with them, but she's kind of like a tenant down there. Okay. She doesn't really come into play with this. So like, I'm not going to say her name and all that just because she doesn't come into play. Okay. They all live in this three-story, beautiful home in D.C. Like I'm talking like just sold for like $2 million, big home. Okay. Joe Price was a big time attorney. Victor worked in marketing and he was in the group responsible for the Got Milk campaigns. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like they got money. And then Dylan like wrote children's books, did a couple of different things but then became like a massage therapist. So he's kind of like a, a soul kind of trying to find his way. It feels like, Mm -hmm. but he's done some pretty cool things. So we know that Robert got to the house at about 1030 at 1149. Victor Zaborski calls 911 and says that an intruder had come in 
and stabbed a guest in their home. And I want to say I found an affidavit from the Superior Court of the District of Columbia that is like the main resource for this. And then, of course, you know, Wikipedia, my fave. But And then there was also this great website that was solely devoted to what happened to Robert Juan. And it had all these links to amazing articles and just like background about him and all of that which was pretty cool. So I uh, actually listened to the 911 call because Victor's the one that calls 911 and the 911 ke- operator keeps referring to him as ma'am. And so it's like, oh, but that's just kind of like a side thing that's like, come on, you know. But anyway, when the 911 operator gets on, she's like, you know, do you need police, fire, or ambulance? And he says he needs ambulance. And... At the very beginning of the call, he says, we heard, we think somebody, an intruder came to the house. We heard a chime, the door. And he goes on to say that their guest had been stabbed. And the 911 operator is like, okay, get a dry cloth. Apply pressure to the wound. If that towel gets soaked with blood, don't take it off. Get another towel put on top of it. And just keep holding pressure until paramedics get there. And Victor says that his partner's holding a towel on the wound. Well, they're actually on the 911 call for like nine minutes, I think. And in the call, he asks the 911 operator what time it is. And so she says it's 2354, you know, which is 1154. And then... Just randomly, without saying, like, she didn't ask him this. He says, the person had one of our knives. Well, about, like, it's, I think it was like five minutes and 40 seconds. Basically, five minutes into the call, the paramedics get there. So, Donna and I, unfortunately, have both had to call 911 on occasions for our parents. And when the paramedics get there, you like meet them at the door. You're like, hey, come here. They're over here. Like, help, 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 right? Yeah. Well, when these paramedics get here, one who had 10 years of experience and one that had 15 years of experience, they said that the environment made the hair on the back of their neck stand up. Wow. Basically, when they got there, one of the paramedics asked, Victor, who was, like, on the phone still, what's going on? And he didn't even answer them. Like, they overheard, I guess, him talking on 911 and saying that something about somebody's getting – somebody got stabbed second floor. So they start going up to the second floor. So I'm going to stop here and just tell a little bit about the house. So the second floor is where the guest bedroom was that Robert was staying in and where Dylan's room is. But once you come up the stairs, you had to like walk back to get to the guest bedroom. And it's not like your typical staircase where you're like doop, 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 upstairs. It like goes up and then you have to go, kind of go around to then go up to the third floor. So when the paramedics come up the stairs, they see Dylan like kind of poke his head out you know, just to kind of like see what was going on. And he's wearing a bathrobe. And so was Victor. Like they were both wearing white bathrobes. They asked Dylan, like, okay, what's going on? And he didn't say anything. He just went back in his room. What the hell? Uh Uh-huh. So they finally get to the guest bedroom. And when they walk in, Joe Price He's sitting on the edge of the bed. Like, so the bed was a pull-out couch kind of thing. So he was sitting on the edge of it, which you know it was very she-she, though. It was not just some, like, 1970s pull-out couch. Like, we've had in our houses before. I mean, this is like a $2 million townhouse in D.C., you know. So he's sitting on the edge of the couch-slash-bed combo. And that's where Robert was laying. But he wasn't applying any pressure With any towel. He was sitting there, like, in his underwear. Like, he's, like, wearing his little whitey tidies, just, like, sitting there. Well, the 
paramedic asks again, what's going on? And he just says, I heard a scream. And he just like stood up and was just kind of standing there. Well, to tell you how weirded out the paramedics were, instead of just like going straight to the bed, the paramedic like went around to the other side to Robert so that his back wouldn't be to Joe. Wow. Because he felt that unsafe. He even like looked at his hands to make sure he didn't have a weapon because they were that uncomfortable. Like this is a surreal like crime scene. Like what the fuck is going on? Right. And they even said like, usually when you come into a situation like this where someone is hurt, they're like yelling at you. This is what happened. Come over here. Yeah. Go this direction. Like, please help them, you know? And, They couldn't get a word out. The other thing that they noticed was that, yeah, they could see where the stab wounds were through Robert's T-shirt, but there was barely any blood. Weird. Yes. And they said it looked like all three of the guys had been, like, freshly showered. Yeah. Now, the female... Room, quote roommate the tenant that lives in the basement she wasn't there she would spend the night i think at her boyfriend's house or something so that's why i say she doesn't really come into play so just know like she wasn't even at the house so it was just those three there the room was pristine the bed that robert's dead body was laying in was perfectly made up and he was just like laying on it the only indention in the bed and in the pillow was from him there was no signs of a struggle. He was just laying there, like, peacefully with his arms beside him. Like, wow. not really any blood. You know, like, nothing. Like, it looked like he was napping, basically. Yeah. Just with stab wounds. Wow. Also, why wasn't Victor up there with Robert and Joe? I don't know. You know, like, yeah. it, if he wasn't going to, like, come and help the paramedics find where they were going like why wasn't he up there maybe he had to meet them outside to know exactly which townhouse to come to because i mean i know even in all our smaller towns sometimes i've had to go out to be like wave to them to be like no no no, this is the yeah. house so maybe because like the townhouses like this townhouse shared a wall with another one and you know maybe they were just all so close together it was easier if somebody could kind of be outside and, and be like hey come you know yeah. This is the house. So I'm guessing that's why, but that's pure speculation. Yeah. But honestly, I don't even see him doing that because I'm not saying that he did it or whatever. I don't know, you know, like yeah. I don't remember this, so I am flying blind here. But like I think that would just lend it more to well, they didn't get here in time. I think if you know, like, if he didn't go outside and flag them down, like, oh, well, they didn't get here in time. But if the 911 dispatcher was telling him, go outside, you know, like, and then he doesn't go outside. Well, he could say I'm outside. True. Because he said, my partner has a towel on him. True. Well, when the paramedics, you know, finally get to Robert, they check for a pulse in all the places And there's nothing. His pupils were fixed and dilated. He wasn't breathing. When they hooked the EKG up, no, you know, basically flatline. He was, he was dead at that point, but they still tried life-saving measures and took him to the hospital. And that's where he was pronounced dead. And that was just 36 minutes from the time that Victor called 911. Wow. Wow. So, in regards to the blood at the scene, the paramedics noticed that there was, like, a light kind of film of blood is how they described it. And it said that it looked like it had, like, striation marks, almost like somebody had wiped the blood on his chest with a towel. Like, put the blood there. Yeah. When police get there, of course, they notice that it's a very nice kind of high-end townhouse and there's a couple of points of entry to the house like a front door a back door like a patio type thing 
like the backyard area has a seven foot fence on it. So, but while it is in a very nice area, it is in a city. So there is crime around there, but that house has never been broken into. When police walk into the first floor, they see that everything's intact. There's flat screen TVs, you know, all these valuables sitting in this first floor. In the part about the things that the police like pointed out in their part of the report, that just, this is just one of those details that makes me so sad because it humanizes the victim in a way that sometimes it's easy to forget when you listen to all this true crime stuff that like, you know, cause you, you really are trying to like learn and understand the criminals and to prevent it and all that. And sometimes it's easy to lose the victim in it. But this thing I'm about to say just humanized him so much to me. So Robert went and got his undergrad at the same place. This is where he and Joe went, was William and Mary College. Oh, my God. I, like, thought about going there. It's a beautiful campus. Well, that's where they did their undergrad. And when he was murdered, he was wearing a gray William and Mary T-shirt. He had on his gym shorts and his underwear. His other, like, work dress clothes were just neatly folded on this table next to him. And I don't know, it just, like, you know, he's wearing his alma mater t-shirt and gym shorts. You know what I mean? Like, he had just taken a shower and laid down or, you know, however it went from there. But, like, he was in his PJs and, you know, and it just, it was just this humanizing detail to me that I was just like, golly. I mean, like, I sleep in my alma mater t-shirts. And, you know, so it was just like this, like, it was just this detail that made me relate to him in such a small, insignificant way. But yeah, I don't know. It, it just touched me. Well, and it's something him and Joe shared, too. Mm-hmm. So if he has anything to do with it or whatever, that's just like another another level of betrayal almost. Well, the police notice the room is immaculate. Nothing had been disturbed or ransacked. They even see that Robert's wallet, his nice watch, and his work BlackBerry were all sitting on the table, like, right there beside him. So, you know, that nothing like that was disturbed. Right. But also next to him was a knife that looked like a knife that came from the kitchen. There were a couple of, like, little, like, spots of blood on the bed, but, like... Like, little spots, not, hey, this person was stabbed three times. One of them, like, directly in the heart. So, Mm. you think there would be, like, cast off or from picking up with a knife or whatever, you know? Yeah. There was none of that. Another thing that they found at the crime scene was this white, I'm picturing, and from the picture, I picture, like, a bath towel, like like a big towel, And this is the towel that they supposedly had used to apply pressure to the wounds. But this towel had, like, three places of blood. One was, like, the largest patch, like, was not big at all. And then there were, like, a couple of little patches. And when experts analyzed that towel, they said what it looked like was someone with a bloody hand held it and, like, folded it around a knife to wipe the knife. Oh. So the big patch of blood was coming off of the knife, and then the little pieces were the blood from their hands, like, tacoing Mm. around the knife. Yeah. The other thing is that the knife that they found next to him was five and a half inches long. The knife wounds on Robert were four to five inches long so it's like okay a half an inch doesn't seem that big but if you think about you stab something you don't stop with like half an inch left on the blade you go all the way down right and there were three stab wounds that were all the exact same so how could someone take a blade that was bigger than the wounds and literally stop and make the exact same 
stab, you know. Right. Like, there, there, that could not have been the knife used to stab him. Moreover, the knife had, like, white cotton fibers that were forensically matched to the towel and had no fibers that would be consistent with the gray T-shirt. So if you stab somebody and it goes through clothing, some of those fibers will end up on the knife. And there were no fibers from his shirt on that five and a half inch knife. Another one of Dylan's like career paths was culinary arts. Like he was a, a chef. And when police are searching the house, they found this really nice cutlery box set. And there was, guess what? A knife missing. Oh, shit. And did it fit the four to five inches? Yes. So police got a box set that matched it and got the knife that was missing from that spot. And it was consistent with the stab wounds in Robert. Wow. So like I said, there were a couple of different entrances like in the house. So police checked all of those entrances and there were no signs of forced entry or you know any anything to indicate an intruder right which is what the men were saying this had to be another thing about the 911 call is that if you listen to the words victor kept saying we saw we heard all the we things mm mm-hmm. An analysis of those words says that when people are using those we's, it indicates that they had talked about it before they called 911. Mm. So even if it was a, oh my God, what happened to him it had to be an intruder, had to be an intruder, you know, and they're like, we think it was an intruder, you know? Yeah. There was some level of discussion beforehand. So is that sinister? Not necessarily. Because it could be like, oh, my God, what the hell happened? And then you're like, I think it was an intruder. And I was like, me too. We think it was an intruder. You know? Yeah. But with his word choice, it makes it seem like there was, you know, some level of conversation beforehand. Right. I'm going to go into a little more detail than we probably usually do with the things that may or may not have happened to Robert. But it goes to the theories. So it's important. Robert had no defensive wounds at all. And Robert was 32 years old. He was a young, strong, you know, virile guy. Like, he's not going to not put up a fight, right? And there are literally no defensive wounds. And again, keep in mind, he's laying in bed like he was fast asleep. Oh, oops, he got stabbed. You know what I mean? Like, it just is bizarre. During the autopsy... They found some, like, needle puncture marks on Robert. So he had marks on the left side of his neck, at the center of his chest, the upper part of his foot, and one on the back of his left hand. Did he do acupuncture? Well, good question. But no. Because they talked to his wife and, like, he had not had any medical treatments, gone to see any doctors, any type of anything within weeks of his murder. Mm -hmm. And so there's no logical reason for these needle puncture marks. What they do know is that those puncture marks were pre-mortem. So he was alive when those happened. The other thing that they found was that Robert had some pooling of blood in his intestines. What that indicated to the medical examiner was that he had actually been alive for a good bit after he was stabbed in the abdomen. Oh, fuck. Yeah, so they knew that, again, the torso stabbings weren't the cause of death. Yeah, Well, did they do a toxicology report? Yes, they did do a toxicology report. They tested for the regular stuff like alcohol, various drugs, all of that. And it came back completely clean. But this is where they fucked up. They didn't test for any paralytic drugs. 
Mm, okay. Because the way in which he was positioned and the fact that there's no defensive wounds, all of that indicates there was something that was subduing him. Yeah. And it wasn't like there were ligature marks on his wrists or ankles or anything like that to have held him down. There had to be some sort of chemical process that held him down, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. But, but it wasn't any drugs that like a standard toxicology would test for. And it could have shown like, okay, well, this is what these puncture marks were from the needles. You would think they would run a more extensive one because he did have all those puncture marks. You know what I mean? Like, well, I have a theory, not, I have a theory, not about why they didn't run that, but I have a theory about the puncture marks. Okay. As part of a regular autopsy, they do like a standard sex kit protocol. They take swabs from the external genitalia and thighs, perianal swabs, anorectal, which is like inside the rectum, and like the mouth lips area. And every one of those swabs, except for the ones from the mouth area, came back with semen. Really? The medical examiner determines that Robert had been sexually assaulted. Oh my gosh, bless his heart. So I want to talk a little bit about this part. Robert was heterosexual, and all three men that lived in the house were homosexual. Victor and Joe were married and had, like, a, a, a more serious relationship. But Joe and Dylan had a dom-submissive relationship. Okay. Dylan was a dom Joe was a submissive. Really? I know. I thought it was going to be the opposite, too. Me, too. too. Which is, it's very interesting because Joe is, like, this high-powered attorney, but he's the sub in his relationship with Dylan. Very interesting to me. Well, it makes sense. Oh, total sense, like but it's he, just interesting. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking because of, like, the massage therapy and mm -hmm. all of that, that he would be the sub just, you he's know. He's more of those giving roles. He did yeah. children's books. Like, it's just more of like a, a caregiver type yeah. role. Like, the children's books, just the massage therapist, the chef. Like, it's yes. just these more, like, giving type roles. Exactly. But, I mean, they literally, their roles in their dom-sub relationship are opposite of their everyday lives. For both of them. Yeah. The three were in like this polyamorous, but not quite, more of like a thruple. Joe and Victor had been together for like 10 years. And Dylan had been with them for about four years, I think. Victor said that they were actually kind of working towards a more serious relationship among all three of them versus just that serious relationship being between Victor and Joe and then them having this sexual relationship on the side. You know, they were working on making it a more traditional polyamorous relationship. Is that a thing? But you get my point. Yeah. Also a question. They were together for 10 years, you said? Mm -hmm. Is that four years after? So they were together total 14 years? No. Or is it 10 years and four of those were with Dylan? Yeah. Okay, okay. I say all that about their relationships because it's important. When police were searching the house, in Dylan's bedroom, they found typical BDSM type equipment. This next thing I want to talk about wasn't in the affidavit that I read, but I did hear this on a couple of things that I listened to about it. So don't quote me on what this is called because I have no idea. But it was said that they found a device in Dylan's room that is designed to basically like force a man to climax and ejaculate like through the electric shock or whatever. And so that potentially that is what was used on Robert allegedly, that would have created all of the semen on him because the semen that was on him was his own. 
Oh, wow. So that's a theory of how, because, I mean, how else, you know what I mean? Like, how else did it end up inside of him? Yeah, okay, so he masturbated, and it would have been on, like, his external genitalia, but it would not have been inside his rectum, you know? So that's why the medical examiner leaned more towards sexual assault because of the location that the semen was in and the fact that he was heterosexual. Robert was very involved in the LGBTQ community and as an ally and supported and one of those, if he was going to be gay, he'd be gay, you know, not, so it's not like it was like the secret life where he, this was the first time he'd ever stayed over. So I just want to like, kind of clear the air about that. Like, there's no, oh, well, him, maybe his wife didn't know. Right. There's no secret life. Right. And again, the people involved were living a polyamorous life. Like, it wasn't, there was no secret about anything. You know what I mean? Right. So it wasn't like it was a orgy gone wrong, you know? Yeah. The police did take a drug dog through the house, and the drug dog is trained to seek out cocaine, marijuana, and opiates. And the drug dog hit on a cabinet in Dylan's room and a dresser in the master bedroom, which is Joe and Victor's room. Um, But... The police had found ecstasy pills already in there, so that could be what it is. For the most part, the three guys, their statements to police were the same. Because they were immediately taken into custody, separated, and asked questions. They all three, of course, had different reactions to the questions, like... Victor was more of the emotional one, which he was on the 911 call, too. There was just a a piece of it where he was just crying. So he tended to be the more emotional one. And Joe tended to be more aloof. Like, he just, he he's an attorney, so he's a hard read, you know? Yeah. But Joe also was kind of the more protector and was like, where's Dylan? Can I talk to Dylan? Is he okay? You know, which was very interesting. Mm-hmm. But and he was like, they, they were like, you know, well, you're free to go, but you can't see Dylan. And, and he was like, well, just let him know I have an attorney on the way for him. And, you know, like he was protecting him, but he didn't really ask much about Victor. So it was just kind of, it was just kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. But basically their story across the board was that Victor had gotten home earlier and he had like been on a business trip. So he was in bed when Robert got to the house. Robert got there at about 1030 and he and Joe and Dylan all had a cup of water in the kitchen, kind of, you know, shot the shit while they were down there and then all went to bed. Robert said he wanted to get a shower. You know, they showed him where everything was. This is where you can shower. This is where you're going to sleep. Here's a towel, yada, 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 night, 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 you know, night, John boy. And, Dylan said that he heard Robert take a shower, get out of the shower, and go into the guest bedroom and close the door. Victor never saw Robert because, again, he was in bed. Well, after everybody had settled in is when Joe and Victor said that they woke up to a security chime on their door. You know you know how when you have an alarm system and it's not set When you open the door, you can have the door chime on. Yeah. Well, they did. Their alarm system wasn't set, so they heard the chime. And in their heads, they said that they thought, oh, well, maybe the the downstairs tenant did come home tonight. And maybe, you know, that was just her. So they didn't get up and check anything. Until a little bit after that, they said that they heard these three grunts. And they were like, what the hell is that? And so they went downstairs to check on Robert and that's when they found him laying there and that he had been stabbed. And then that's when they said that Dylan came out and was like, what's going on? And then kind of like went back into his room. They called 911. They said that they never saw or heard anyone running away. 
They had wooden steps, like, so you know that's, like, creaky, creaky, you know? Right. They heard nothing, saw nothing, nothing's missing. They didn't hear a second door chime, but they know they didn't do it, so it had to be an intruder kind of thing. But their timeline doesn't actually match other reports. So remember how I said it's a townhouse that a wall adjoins another townhouse? Well... Along that wall is the guest bedroom where Robert was sleeping. Well, the neighbor was watching the 11 o'clock news. And they said that they heard a scream coming from, you know, the other townhouse. And based on the segment of the news that he was watching, they know it had to be at the earliest 11, but at the latest 1130. So now we have this extra like 30 minute window of, well, what actually happened at that house then? Right. Because it's not as a narrow of a window as originally thought based on when the 911 call happened and and all of that. So there was more time if there was some sort of cover up. But also, why ask the 911 operator what time it is? I can't figure that piece out. That's important. And I don't, like, I've seen stuff kind of talk about, like, the timeline and all of that. But I I don't know. I just, like, they use his question about the time to, like, piece the timeline together. But I'm telling you, there's something to that I just can't put my finger on yet. In addition to the drug dog, the police also brought in a cadaver dog. And the dog hit on two locations as well. The first one was the lint trap of the dryer that's located outside of the bathroom by Dylan's bedroom. The second place was a drain in the courtyard behind the house. But remember, this is the area that I said has like a seven foot fence. There was a water hose back there that was like uncoiled, like maybe somebody had just used it. So they're saying like somebody could have gone down the back stairwell, out the thing, you know, rinsed off any of the blood and then put those wet clothes in the dryer, which is what made the dog hit on the lint trap. Well, that makes sense. Right. So with the intruder theory... Basically, what they're saying is someone happened upon this house, either scaled a seven-foot fence or happened to find this door that was unlocked, came in, passed all of the valuables on the first floor, went up to the second floor, walked all the way down the hall, found this one room where Robert was sleeping, and stabbed him three times and left before anybody could come downstairs or come out of the room and check on him and nobody heard a peep except for the alleged intruder coming in the house with the door chime. Mm, Doesn't make any sense. Nope, not adding up. But I have a couple of questions, though. And then I'm going to wrap it up. I just like theories to kind of ponder that I want to get off my chest. One is... While the needle stick marks things were pre-mortem, this is my theory. I think, allegedly, the one in the neck is what they used for the paralytic to incapacitate him. And then the others were almost like some sort of like torture play. Well, there is needle play. Yeah, and so I really do think that they used something to incapacitate him and then that's what all those other random puncture wounds were because it was kind of random placements you know what i mean like you're not gonna like give someone medicine in some of the places you know what i mean like okay so it was like on the top of the foot but if someone's like a drug addict and they're using their foot they're going between the toes you know what i mean yeah stuff like that so it's like i don't those weren't typical placements right i now the neck i think that's where they gave him the whatever they gave him yeah and it was just Dumb luck that they didn't do further toxicology testing to figure out what it was. Yeah. But here's what I just, I cannot wrap my head around. 
other than the time question on the 911 call. Yes. This is the the big one for me. No matter who did it, where in the fuck is the blood? Yeah. Because that means that, let's just say, for the sake of the most time possible, it happened right at 11 o'clock. And the 911 call happened at 1149. Even if they had all 49 minutes, that means that they would have to have, what, clean the body in a way? Like, because the stab wounds were pre-mortem. Like, that is what, like, that was ruled the cause of death. The stab wound that went into his heart was the cause of death. There was no blunt force trauma, nothing like that. Like, he was alive and bleeding when those occurred. But do you think they, like, took the blood out of him? No, because that would have been on the autopsy. True. But it's like, so what they what did they do? Did they take his shirt off of him, stab him, clean up the blood, and then put his shirt back on him, and then put stab wounds through the shirt in the exact spot? Like, there was no blood on the shirt, so there was no blood on the bed. There was no blood in on any floors. The dogs didn't hit on any blood in the drains and the bathtubs. Where the fuck is all the blood? I mean, I'm no blood expert, but I feel like there'd be, at the very least, some pulling out of him. Like, yeah. P-O-O-L. <laughs> y'all, know, y'all know my accent. Like, it would come out and be under him on the bed, and it yeah. wasn't. Like, someone please help me understand why there was no blood, where the fuck the blood is, because... Even microscopic drops of blood in crevices and things. I mean, think about cleaning up a crime scene and how long that shit actually takes so that you clean it up enough that there's no forensic evidence. This was in 2006, so it's not like this was that long ago that, like, DNA didn't exist. Right. The the luminol test didn't, you know what I mean? Like, this all existed. Like, this was not in 1972, you know? Where the fuck is all the evidence? How in the shit, even if these three guys did it, how did they clean this up that fast? I mean, I need to hire them to clean my damn house. Fucking Molly maids could never. <laughs> so what happened? Okay. So they eventually charged all three with obstruction of justice. They charged Dylan first, and then the, the next month they charged Victor and Joe. They were all arrested and then were released, like, on bond or whatever, pending trial. And ankle monitors, curfews, all the things. And the biggest resource for this that I used was the affidavit for the arrest warrant for Dylan. So I didn't, like, go into that, like, whenever I said, I was just like, it's just an affidavit. But it was for his arrest warrant. But I didn't want to, like, spoiler alert. Well, guess what? The judge found all three of them not guilty. What? Mm -hmm. Not guilty on the charges of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and tampering with evidence. So the judge explained her ruling for like an hour. And she said, basically, as a person, she thinks they did it. But... With the evidence that was presented to her, she couldn't, without a reasonable doubt, say they did. And so she's like, I think you did it, but they just couldn't prove it to me. So they're all three free. Wow. But Robert's wife, Catherine, did file a wrongful death lawsuit against all three of them. And... I think originally she was asking for like $2 million or something, but they settled like for an undisclosed amount that we, we don't know. Yeah. Wow. And that's, that's it. So this is still unsolved. There are no fucking answers for all of these like, what? Questions. Yeah. Like, how? How? The only good thing about that is... There's no statute of limitations on murder. Yes. So if they can find some more evidence or 
and they charge them with obstruction and conspiracy, right? Not murder. So there's exactly. no double jeopardy. Exactly. So, you know what we need? We need Sheila Wysocki and her freaking team mm-hmm. to get up on this. And I'm not joking. No, I know you're not. Because she's amazing. We need her and her team to get up on this because she will find the fucking answers. Because what are the answers? Like, really and truly, the like the blood thing for me. And like, he was laid perfectly on the bed. Like, the only indigents in the bed were from his body. So it's not like, you know what I mean? Like, there was nobody else on the bed. So there was... Literally no evidence of a struggle. So he had to be subdued. Yeah. Because even if they had him tied down, he'd still be thrashing around. Right. I don't know what the answer is, but I can tell you it's not an intruder. Mm Mm-mm. I feel like that is as stupid as a... Owl? Well, no. The intruder theory for John Bonet, it's not an intruder. I disagree because that one investigator did show how that could happen. This one would have to be fucking Jason Bourne and scale offense and do all the things to come in and have cat like steps up a wooden staircase and nobody here and be able to leave. So he must have left the door cracked because the door didn't chime again. You know what I mean? Like at least like if it was an intruder for, for John Monet, like, they had time. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, a lot because they wrote a book. But you get what I'm saying, though. Like, they had more time to, to do those things. Whereas, like, this would have had to have been, like, a 15-minute hit. Like, like, this would have to be a fucking hit. So, I mean, did Radio Free Asia have some shit going on that we didn't know about? They had that new DJ. I don't know. But, God, this is... I want to go on such a deep dive. Can Hunt a Killer have this as their case or something? <laughs> because this needs to be solved. Why is this not a Netflix series? Right? I don't know, but I hope that yours has an ending. Well. Oh, fuck. All right. Well, now I want you to picture it. Amherst, Nova Scotia, August 1878. We're focusing on an 18-year-old girl named Esther Cox. At this point, she was living with her oldest sister, Olive, and Olive's husband, Daniel. And they had two sons that lived there as well. And then, actually, a lot more people lived in the house. Daniel's brother, John, Olive's brother, William, and another sister of hers, Jane. Please be an exorcism. Please be an exorcism. No. So, she moved to the house with her other siblings after her grandmother died. So, a little history on Esther. When she was three weeks old, her mother died. Later on, her father remarried and moved to be with his new wife and start a new life that did not include his kids. What a piece of shit. Right. So, all the kids were taken care of by their grandmother. Yeah. Thank God for grandparents. Right. Esther is usually described as being oddly serious, old-fashioned, and exceptionally moody. Other than the old-fashioned part, that's pretty much a teenager. She's I was 18. Say, yeah. There was one person who seemed to pay her some special attention, and that was a co-worker of her brother-in-law, Daniel, and his name was Bob McNeil. Well, Esther had some feelings for him, too, and her sisters often picked on her for having a crush and, you know, all the things that siblings do. Well, one day, Bob came over and invited Esther for a ride in his carriage, because, you know, 1878. Very she-she. <laughs> and I can only imagine the butterflies she had, you know, because Bob came over and hung out because he was a co-worker of Daniel's. But this time he came over... For her. Right. And so, you know, she happily obliged and off they went. This is like every girl's dream who has a brother. Yes. You know what I mean? Or as the friend... Because I I don't have any brothers. So as the friend... Like of someone with a brother, I'm like, oh, I want the brother to like me. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, Esther really didn't know where they were going, so she didn't think anything about it when Bob took her 
to a wooded area in the country. Oh, God. However, when he stopped the carriage, he asked her to walk into the woods with him and basically fool around with him. Esther said no. She wasn't okay with that. Again, she's old-fashioned, you know. Well, Bob was not going to be denied. Oh, God. So he quickly withdrew a revolver (gasps) from his pocket and ordered her to go with him. Esther remained strong and refused again, and Bob was infuriated. And just about when he was about to, like, pull the trigger and just be done with it, they both heard a noise, and it was another carriage approaching. Bob didn't want to give Esther a chance to rat him out or scream or, like, cause a commotion. And also, he has a gun on him. Mm -hmm. So he's like, okay, got back in the buggy and headed back to the house. He let her out. He didn't walk her up to the door or anything and basically grumbled that she was no good and, like, he should have killed her and, you know, whatever. When guys get denied how they... You know, like, well, I didn't like you anyway. Oh, oh, well, you're fat anyway. Okay, it wasn't when you fucking DM'd me. Right. He was the original incel. Well, Esther did what most of us would have done in that situation. She went in, crawled in bed, and cried herself to sleep. (sighs) Esther was sullen and withdrawn in the following days, but everyone assumed they just got in a fight because that's what she told them. Like, we just had a fight. It was, you know, that's it. And honestly, no one really liked Bob. So they weren't complaining that he wasn't around every day like he was before. So they were just like, oh, that sucks. Mm -hmm. But And also, they have a lot of fucking people in the house. So another person coming in, eating up all their food, Mm -hmm. being up there, you know, like, and if he's allowed, God, am I talking about me? (laughs) I mean, people in glass houses. <laughs> right? I'm like, shit. <laughs> but, you know, they, they're they like, we can take a break, mm-hmm. you know? So, so far, it looks like it's going to be a story Carrie should cover, right? Right. But here's where it takes a turn. On September 4th, 1878, everyone in the household was going to bed. Esther and her sister Jane shared a bed. And they were just laying there talking, settling in for the night, you know, doing what sisters do. If there were anything like me and Tiffany, when she would spend the night, it'd be like, would you rather? And we're like eight. (laughs) I mean, true. Oh, my gosh. If there anything like Casey and I were when we had to share a room when we were kids. I mean, we were like little. We weren't 18 and however old. But, God, we'd always get in trouble. Go to bed. Quit talking. Yeah. Yeah. Well... Just while they were laying down, Esther screamed because she felt something under the covers. Well, she thought it was a mouse. And I think she had saw one earlier that day. And so it was just in her mind that, like, there's a mouse in the house. And if something was underneath the covers, it was a mouse. That's what it was. But she felt something weird, blamed it on the mouse, easy to write off. However, her and Jane searched and couldn't find anything. But they're like... Quick little creatures, you know. They finally calmed down, went to sleep. The next night, September 5th, Esther heard rustling underneath the bed, and she was like, it's that damn mouse again. So this time, Jane heard it too, and so they looked underneath the bed, and they concluded that the rustling noises were coming from the cardboard box that's underneath their bed. And all it had were fabric pieces in it for a quilt that they were going to make later. So they timidly got the box from the bed, put it in the middle of the room. But when they did, it jumped up in the air, like a foot up in the air. So they were like, okay, the mouse is in the box. Like, Mm -hmm. that's the only way this could have, you know, like, I don't know. He was doing Mouse Olympic stuff. Yeah. Throw it away. Burn it down. Burn everything down. (laughs) Yeah. So they're like, oh, shit. Trying to think what to do. Well, it jumped again. So they screamed for Daniel. He's the man of the house, you know. So he came and helped, but he ended up laughing at them because he was like, y'all must be dreaming. This box cannot jump in the air. Like, we don't have a mouse. Like, whatever. He opened the box. There's just fabric pieces for the quilt. You know, he's like, go to bed. And, you know, you're you're crazy. Well, that satisfied them. They're like, okay, maybe we were just tired. Like, who knows? 
They apologized. Daniel grumbled his way back, you know, like, oh my God, I woke up for this, you know, and they soon fell asleep. Well, the next night, shit continued, but this time it wasn't a rustling noise. Esther woke her sister Jane up by screaming, crying out, wake up, Jane, I'm dying. What's happening to me? I am dying. Melodramatic, but she's 18. Also, why is she dying? Well, Jane opened her eyes, you know, like kind of blinked her eyes open, lit the bedside lamp just to see what's going on, and she was startled by Esther's appearance. Her face was basically blood red, her eyes were bulging out, and Jane just reacted like we all would, screamed, you know, like in horror. Esther screamed in panic. Their sister Olive and her husband Daniel came to see what's going on. Not really knowing what to do, Olive just had Esther lay back down in bed. And that's when Esther choked out, I'm swelling up. I shall certainly burst. Okay. And Esther's complexion was now extremely pale instead of that bright red. And now her skin was like burning hot like she had a fever where she was cold before. But she was swelling. So her face was like plumping up. Her hands were swelling. Like her feet were swelling. Esther was in visible distress and just writhing in pain on the bed and crying out. And then all of a sudden, a huge boom sound happened. It was like a clap of thunder. And it just filled the room. Oh, shit. (laughs) Well, then it was shortly followed by three loud cracking sounds underneath the bed. Then Esther went completely limp and her appearance started to return to normal. And when she was back to completely a normal appearance, she fell right to sleep. So her family had to check and make sure she was, in fact, still alive and breathing, not dead. And when they were sure, okay, she's still breathing, they all went back to bed. Oh, my God. There's so many things going through my mind. I'm like, okay, it was a voodoo doll. Okay, he cast a spell on her. Okay, he astral projected. Okay, he did it. I'm like, all these things are going through my mind, and I don't know shit about shit. So I'm like, but what is it? The morning after, Esther was in good spirits, and everything seemed to be okay besides her appetite, which was less than normal. So they all tried to discuss what happened, but they couldn't make sense of it. So they were like, let's just keep it in the family for now, because we all sound crazy. Everything seemed okay and back to normal for a couple of nights. But on the fourth night, Esther suffered another swelling attack. However, this time, other stuff happened too. The bed sheets were pulled from under and on top of the girls, and it was just like an invisible hand ripped them away from the bed. Jane fucking fainted from this. She was just like, well, I'll be, and fainted. (laughs) And (laughs) yeah, Now, like, you know, they couldn't say a mouse did this. Mm -hmm. Like, no. And about this time, they hear Esther screaming in pain again. So Olive and Daniel come back. And this time they have William and John. And William is Olive's brother. And John is Daniel's brother. Poor Olive. She doesn't really know what to do. You know, I mean, she's young. She might be the oldest sister, but she's still young. Mm-hmm. She was just like, okay, um, let's just try to put the covers back on the girls. Like, everything's okay. Yeah. You know? Well, they were just flung right off again, same manner. And they're like, oh, shit. Well, then a pillow is hurled at John, Daniel's brother, at him and hits him in the face. So he was like, fuck this and left the room. Everyone else puts the covers back on the bed and then sat on the covers to keep them from flying off. Then the loud knocks came from underneath the bed and immediately Esther's swelling went down and she passed out again into that sleep mode. And again, like they all just kind of, okay, well, I guess go to bed, you know, question mark, question mark. And then they finally fell asleep. Not really knowing what else to do, Daniel went to a local doctor and 
the doctor laughed at him and was like, that could not actually happen, you know? Well, Daniel's like, well, come see for yourself. Like, I would need her to get checked out. Something is up. And so the doctor's like, all right, I'll be there at 10. And he showed up at 10, immediately checked Esther out. And she had been in bed for like an hour. And he said that she had suffered from a shock of some kind. And she was having a nervous issue, which we all know, like back in the day, that's what they said. You got like a nervous issue, a nervous condition. Mm -hmm. That was everything. Well, as the doctor is saying this, Esther's pillow is moving from underneath her head until like only one corner is tucked underneath her head. And the doctor watches this and he's like, holy crap, like, did y'all just see what I saw? And they're like, "Uh, yeah, that's what we told you. Right. And John is in there and he's like, yeah, I did. And I'm just going to get this pillow before it comes at me again. (laughs) Well, before he could, the pillow went right back underneath her head. So he's like, no, 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 and tried to pull it. And it's like, it wouldn't budge. Mm -mm. And he's like, "Mm mm-mm, like, no, no. And like, it just went further underneath her head. You know, like he was nothing at all. So he was like, "Mm, bye. (laughs) He's out. Uh, Yeah. He said, I ain't fucking with you. Right. Well, shortly after this, the loud knock sounded from beneath the bed again. And, you know, the doctor's like, let me examine. Because apparently he thinks he knows everything. So he's like, let me examine. Looks underneath there, walks around the room. And the knocking kind of follows him, you know. And so he's like, hmm, all right. Well, about a minute of the knocking and him kind of walking around, the bed sheets fly off again. What the hell? The knocking usually signifies the end. Right. So the doctor is freaking out now because, holy shit, they've just done the trick where, you know, the whole tablecloth gets pulled out and, like, the girl's still laying on the bed and the whole bed sheet's off and freaking out. However, they hear this scratching sound and it sounds like metal. I mean, just think about nails on a chalkboard. That's what it's going to sound like. And so they're like, oh, my God. Well, they see something being carved into the wall. And slowly but surely, those scratching and markings, it makes a sentence. And it says, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill. Holy shit. Right. And it's like right above her bed. No one is there. Like, you know, no one is writing this they're all there with no tools in their hand this isn't like right now where they could have you know some kind of crazy shit like this is 1878 over the next three weeks the activity increased and it was not just in the frequency it was also in the intensity esther was again the subject of it She had potatoes thrown at her from the basement when she went down there. Also, like, a wooden plank from the basement. What is she, a fucking pirate? (laughs) And then also, like, that banging noise was just everywhere in the house now. Like, it wasn't just underneath the bed. The doctor's like, we need to calm Esther down because he's coming back because he's all up in this now. Yeah. He prescribed morphine to Esther And so, you know, whatevs. So he had that, like he administered it. And there was another incident. Well, while this banging's going on, he's like, I'm going to go see if anyone hears this. Like, is it only inside because it's so loud? Like, does anyone else hear this? Goes outside and he said, from the street, you could hear it, and it sounds like someone is standing on the roof and pounding it with a sledgehammer. Duh. Yeah, and, like, no one's up there. Like, no, you know, no one is around to make this noise. Meanwhile, it's always at night. I mean, for the most part. I know, mm-hmm. like you said, when it escalated, it was all the time. But, like, why you got to fuck with their sleep? Right? It's because they're most vulnerable. Well, one night... Mm -hmm. In late September, there was another session of knocking going on. Esther had a seizure in her bed. 
Oh, no. Yeah, and just became very cold again, very rigid. And she became kind of in a trance, you know. Well, then all of a sudden she started to tell them about the whole incident with Bob McNeil. None of them knew about it. They just thought they had a fight. That was it. Well, like she told them, like, he tried to rape me. This is what happened. You know, all the things. Well, when she woke up from the trance, they were like, this is what you said. Is it right? And she was like, yeah, like, that's right. But I have, I don't remember telling you this, but that's all true. That's what happened. I just didn't want to tell you. Well, I mean, it's 2020 here and we still victim blame. Right. Well, what were you wearing? Well, you know what I mean? All right. those things. So, of course, she didn't want to tell anybody in fucking 1878. Mm-hmm. Well, and also, there was a man who wrote a book about her and her life. He described her as not being very attractive. Fuck him. Uh Uh-huh. And short and stout, kind of, basically. I mean... I'm feeling personally attacked. You're not short. (laughs) Don't steal my jokes. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, so I feel like that probably... Played a part, too, if she didn't think she was as attractive as her sisters who were married yeah. or whatever. And so she's like, I should be happy that he wanted to do, you know, yes. all of that, what we. Self-doubt and negative yes. talk and all the things that you reason shit. and Yes, you reason in a way and you put the blame on yourself and we take it in and we. Internalize it. Yes. So, and I'm not saying that's what she did. I'm just saying. If it were me, I know that's what I would be thinking and all of that. Meanwhile, I don't care if you fucking look like Shrek. No one deserves to be assaulted. Right. Well, the knocking was the most consistent thing that happened. And soon they all kind of learned, okay, I think it's talking to us. Like it understands us. And so Dan was like, how many people are in the room? And they knocked the correct amount. Oh, shit. Yeah, and they said each rap, each knock, was violent enough to shake the entire house. Oh, my God. So it wasn't just like a scratch on the wall or a tap, you know? Well, over the next several weeks, they developed a method. Picture Stranger Things with the Christmas lights. Yeah, because, I mean, this was their new normal, And so it's like, hey, if this is what's going to happen, we need a way to communicate and try to figure out what's going on. So they would ask closed-ended questions, yes, no, and kind of like a maybe, like I don't know. One knock for no, three knocks for yes, and two knocks were like, I don't know. Also, while, you know, they're like, regulating all of this they have people like clergymen coming in because you know people are now it's getting out about all of this craziness because one you can hear it neighbors can hear crazy sounds coming over from the house and everything the doctor is like staying at their house sometimes to figure this shit out yeah all the things so they came in you know just trying to disprove trying to prove all you know both sides were coming in because this was so unique one of them was a methodist preacher and he said that he witnessed tons of manifestations while he stayed at the house and one time he was like the thing that was just like what was there was a bucket that was just on the kitchen table And it began to, like, boil and bubble like it was boiling. Like, it was just hot. And it was ice cold before. You know, like, it was Mm -hmm. just there. And, you know, like, how. Yeah, it's not like it was, like, over an open flame. Right. Other things began to happen, like, sewing pins would appear from nowhere. And they were jabbed into Esther's face. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. All of this continued up until December, but that's when Esther got diphtheria. Oh, no. Well, it took her two weeks to get over it, 
And during those two weeks, nothing happened. When she got better, she made a trip to Sackville, New Brunswick. And that was where one of her other sisters, who was married, lived. And so she spent two weeks up there just, you know, kind of like... Rejuvenating almost. Yeah, like recharging her battery. You know, like, one, everything's happened in her sister Olive's house. Then she got diphtheria. So she's like, I just need to change the scenery. Let me go up to my other sister, whatever. Well, when she returned, her and Jane switched rooms because they're like, maybe it's something in this room because everything, even though it moved around the house, it really started in that room and centered around that room. But it didn't help. Shit got worse. Oh, God. Well, one time, all of the gang was there in their new room and lit matches rained down from the ceiling, like, out of nowhere. What? Yeah. And, like, the house is, you know, made of wood. Yeah. So they would put them out, you know? So they're like, what the fuck? But, okay. Well, then one of Esther's dresses, which had been hanging on a door, rolled itself up, traveled underneath the bed, and burst into flames. So they had to put that shit out. They're like, what the hell is going on? So they're like, literally, we have no idea. It got so bad that they would keep buckets of water like they did in the kitchen that time in every room because, again, the house is wood. So they would need to be able to stop a fire if it got out. However, there was this one time when Olive and Esther were alone and they were like making butter or something and there was a fire that started in the cellar. Well, by the time they figured it out, they couldn't put it out by themselves. And so they ran out and they were like, help, help. And this guy walking down the street, they did not know him. He was not a neighbor. Came in, got one of the mats from the dining room like a rug, and then basically snuffed out the fire. Didn't say anything to him, just turned and left, and they never saw him again. Like, he didn't wait to be thanked or anything. And so they're like, okay. Well, so after that, they not only had, you know, sporadic fires to contend with, the entity, or whatever it was, began to talk to Esther And, again, she was the only one who could hear it. However, one night, everyone was in the family room or the parlor. And all of a sudden, Esther stood up. Her face was drained of color. And she just kind of pointed to a corner of the room. And she was like, look there. Look there. Can't you see it? My God, it's a ghost. Don't you all see him? Again, she's a little melodramatic. She's 18. I mean, she's seeing a fucking ghost. She could be a drama queen. She continued, There he stands in all gray. See how his eyes are glaring at me and he laughs when he says, I must leave the house tonight or he will start a fire in the loft under the roof and burn us all to death. Leave tonight and go where? Right. Well, they didn't hear the ghost say any of this, but she was like, I can't be here. Like, we can't risk this. You know, I mean, we have lit matches falling from the fucking sky. This is serious. So Daniel was like, all right, we have a neighbor. And he had already like been interested in Esther and what's going on at the house. Not interested in her romantically. He's married, but Like, he had pity for her. So Daniel went and was like, hey, can you keep her for a little bit? So he asked his wife, and she was like, of course we can. So off she went. She stayed there for, like, two weeks. Nothing bad happened. Everything was going good. Until? Right. One day, she is helping clean the house, and she's scrubbing the floor, And the brush that she was using just disappeared from her hand. 
So she's like, um, oh my gosh. Well, I was cleaning and this is what happened. Like she told the neighbor's wife. And so they went to search for the brush. Like, where could it be? It can't just disappear. Uh, while they're searching, um, the brush fell from the ceiling and it hit Esther in the head. Oh my God. So they're like, well, maybe that was just a fluke. I don't know what that was, but okay. Well, then another six weeks went by and there wasn't any like major, like, you know, no fires, like literally no fires to put out. However, they started. So the neighbor was like, all right, we can't have our house burn, but I own a pub and you can go stay there. So she's like, okay. Meanwhile, his pub was like, Going under, and he was like, give me a fire for the entrance, <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Evil genius. You can't stay here, but <laughs> I have a place. <laughs> and a plan. Well, shit started happening at the pub, too. One of the most, like, what the hell incidents is when the neighbor's son, he was playing with a little pocket knife, and, uh, yeah, it basically flew out of his hand and landed in Esther's back. <gasps> mm-hmm. So she's like, ow. And it didn't, like, do a lot of damage because it's just a little pocket knife. But also, <laughs> it's a knife. Right. So it was removed, given back to the little boy. And, yeah, flew through the air again. <gasps> and... Also went back into her back. Oh, my God. And it was, like, right in the same spot. So even if it was, like, the little boy throwing it, ain't no way a little boy is an expert, like, darts player, even if his dad does own a pub, okay? (laughs) All right. So fast forward to the spring of 1879, and Esther went back to St. John, New Brunswick, And she is staying there in the city. She was invited by someone who wanted to, like, see if they can communicate with the entity or anything like that. You know, people are interested. This person was like, okay, I have a new way to communicate. Instead of the yes, no, maybe, we're going to do the alphabet and they can knock at the right letter. And then we'll do the whole thing and... They'll, like, spell out the answer to, you know, to different stuff. During her stay, they ask the entity to, like, who is haunting Esther? What is surrounding Esther? What's going on? And apparently there were several spirits. One identified themselves as Bob Nickel. That was, like, the main one. That was the one who was a fire starter. He was the, like... The trickster. And then another spirit said her name was Maggie Fisher. And then another one said his name was Peter Cox. And he said that he was a relative of Esther's, but he died about 40 years ago. Then there's one called Mary Fisher, Jane Nichol, and Eliza McNeil. And, I mean, if you think about it, Bob Nichol sounds like... Bob McNeil, and then she had that Eliza McNeil as a spirit, too. Like, I don't know. Like, I wonder if if that was, like, an old wife of his or someone of him or I don't know. And let me just say this. Bob McNeil was not heard from again, so we don't know what happened to him. Interesting. So now they knew, like, multiple spirits were around, like, okay. Esther kind of just went different places trying to save her family from traumatic incidents again. So she stayed eight weeks with a family who lived in the country. But after that, she was like, oh, my gosh, I miss Amherst. Like, Amherst was kind of like a small city, but still a city, not the country. And also, I think, too, she she's not getting any younger. 
and she needs to be able to meet people and she's not going to meet anyone on the farm secluded. So she did. She asked Daniel if she could move back with them and he was like, of course, of course you can, you know. So she did and basically immediately the haunting began again. Well, at this point, there was this other person who actually played a huge part in her life after this named Walter Hubble. And he was an actor and then became a writer. But he was staying in an extra room that they had that they would rent out sometimes to different people. So he was staying there. But he was staying there in hopes to see Esther and like catch the family line. Like, he was very skeptical of this. Okay. Over six weeks, he got what he wanted, but he learned that uh, they're not touching anything. They're in here with me when shit happens, you know? He would watch things drop from the ceiling. He would watch objects levitate. He saw different fires just appear, like, just ignite out of nowhere. So Hubble was now convinced Esther is this poor girl that is having this shit happen to her. She's not doing this to herself. No one in the family is, you know, doing this to her. Like, this is for real. So he was like, all right, I'm going to try to talk to the spirits as well. Same technique, you know, the whole thing. So he said, all right, tell me the time on my watch. Told him the time on the watch. Ask how many coins were in his pocket. And they told him. And I think even like a year that was on the coin or something. Like that he wouldn't know. And it, it, you know, knocked out the answer. Well, and then he asked them these questions. So here's, I'm just going to give you like a question, answer, question, answer. Yeah. Have you all lived on the earth? Yes. Have you seen God? No. Are you in heaven? No. Are you in hell? Yes. (gasps) Have you seen the devil? Yes. (gasps) So he's like, oh, shit. You know, like, this is just kind of now sinister. Like, okay, this could be evil. Yeah. Before, it was like a mischievous kind of thing. But what if this is evil? What if they really are trying to kill Esther? There was this one weird incident, June 28th, 1878, that all throughout the house, you could hear a trumpet. And it, like, continued for a long time. And then a small little trumpet fell from the ceiling. And all of them were like, never had a trumpet. Never had a trumpet. And Hubble was like, me either. And so he went to like the local shops around to be like, have you ever had this trumpet in your shop? Like, could they be lying? Right. You know. Mm -mm. And again, this is still... Horse and buggy kind of things. It's not like, oh, let me Amazon Prime this. Right. Like, no, no, no. They will get dysentery and die on the way to the Oregon Trail. Been there. (laughs) So, again, the shit was going on, and it increased to a point where they were scared if their house burnt and it was a strong enough wind, that meant that, like, her... Like, their whole neighborhood could burn because all the houses are wood at this point. So, it's like, holy shit. And it's like a maritime city. So, strong winds do occur. True. So, they're, you know, they're like, oh, my God, we can't really take this. But, like, also, she's family, so you can't really just kick her out. But what to do? So... Esther left and she went on the speaking engagement tour with Walter Hubble, okay? And Walter wanted to tell people like his thoughts on Esther and why he thought this was happening, all the things. 
that was kind of short lived, you know, because people, you know, thought she was a fraud because shit wouldn't happen on stage, but it would happen in the hotel rooms and stuff. But yeah, because she's not comfortable on stage, like shit's just not going to happen when you want it to happen. We all know that. Mm-hmm. Hello. Well, so she went back to Amherst, but she didn't stay with Olive and Daniel. She just stayed with a friend of their family. Well, it was on a farm, and she was the only one at home at the time, and she saw that the barn was burning, (gasps) and she was like, oh my gosh, let me try to put this out, and she was actually accused of arson. Oh, no. And so... She was sentenced to four months in prison, but released after one because of good behavior and also because people in the town were like, no, 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 no. You got to know her backstory. Like, yeah, this shit like happens to her and, you know, all this shit. Well, after she got out of prison, she ended up marrying a man who actually went and visited her. Weird. While she was in prison. Mm Mm-hmm. But... After she married him, the activity stopped for good. And he died, I think, and she actually ended up marrying twice. And with her last husband, she moved to Brockton, Massachusetts. And she died November 8th, 1912, and she was 52 years old. Oh, she was young. Yeah, And the book that Walter Hubble wrote is The Great Amherst Mystery. And in that book, it has 16 affidavits that 16 witnesses signed that they said, we have seen these things happen at their house. Wow. But like, what was it? To me, it's just like poltergeist activity for sure. Because it manifested, like, after she was assaulted by the guy. True. You know, and then she went into the depressive state with that. And then she didn't tell anyone. So I think when she internalized all of that, her body just didn't know how to handle it. You know? I don't know. I'm just saying, like, it sounds like poltergeist activity. It sounds like things we've heard before where they've determined it was a poltergeist. So I'm just saying that. But no one knows because it just stopped as soon as it happened. You know, like as easy as it happened, it stopped. But also it stopped when she married a man. Right. So I feel like it really was centered around those feelings with her. A.K.A. fuckface that tried to assault her. Yeah. Yeah. And when she finally felt accepted and loved and safe, she was free from those spirits. But some people can say that because she was in that depressive state, she was in a vulnerable state and spirits attached onto her and like basically attacked her then because she was in a vulnerable position. That's true. So I don't know. Definitely... Both of these stories don't have an ending. Ugh, the worst. Why do we do this? Again, we don't plan it. But when I was reading this, I was like, holy shit. This girl went through some shit. Her whole family did. Yeah. And, like, everybody saw it. Like, Mm -hmm. it wasn't like, okay, it only happened when it was just, like, her and her sister. Or it only happened when whatever. Like, no, like, neighbors saw it. Like, Right. You can't get that many people in on the scheme. Yes. And, like, they had nothing for it. And after all of these years, no one has said, okay, I lied about that. Yeah. Or whatever. Like, no one has changed their story. And, like, clergymen put their name on these things that I saw this, you know? So it's like, I don't, you know, I mean, it's hard to disbelieve it Mm -hmm. on that. But also it's like. What happened? I don't know. Holy shit. So earlier when I was like, is it a voodoo doll? Is this? Is that? Is this? And it's like, could, like, it literally could Could be. Could be anything. 
it sounds more like some sort of curse. Yeah. Well, also, if you think about it, no one ever heard from Bob McNeil again. What if he died and his ghost came back to haunt her because she rejected him? You know, like, I'm not saying that happened. I'm just saying, like, who knows? Who knows? Because, again, one of it was Bob Nickel. That was that was the main thing. Yeah, I thought that, too. Thing. So it's like... That just seemed, and I feel like when you're doing like the knocks for the letters, that's very easy to like get some shit wrong on that. You yeah, know? yeah. And but like Bob, okay, easy. But McNeil, Nickel, I'm like mm, maybe, maybe you can fudge that up. I don't know. But hopefully, y'all will tell us what y'all think on both of these. We want to hear. All of your opinions, like always, because y'all are so much smarter than we are. Yes, and keep the suggestions coming because y'all know we love those. Because y'all send us some of the like best stories that we would have never in a million years found. So keep sending in suggestions and sinister sightings. Also, if you thought some of the recording was weird on that last sinister sightings, uh, you're not wrong because... Some spirit was playing with us. Oh, my God. We recorded that episode like three times. No lie. And like every time something was messed up. And so poor Will, like he was last minute. He was like, uh, I think I stitched it together right. <laughs> you I'm know? like, I thought Venus was in retrograde, not Mercury. What the fuck? Right. So y'all, I hope y'all enjoyed it because there were some great stories on that. Yes. I mean, like, whoo. I tell you what, your story was pretty damn good today. Yours was too. Oh my gosh, I love this episode. Me too. I'm going to go on Web Sleuths and see what I can find out about your story. See what you can sleuth? <laughs> Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> <It was. laughs> All right, y'all stay safe and healthy and remember, creep it real and, and don't, don't get, get scared. scared.